Hands up, who still has a membership at a video library? <laughs> Hands up, who bought something from a record store recently? When was the last time you wrote a letter and then wrote the address on a letter and then went to a letterbox and actually posted that letter? In the last month, hands up? Not many. Mm -hmm. Who's still got a library card? Nice, I do too. When was the last time you ordered a dirty movie and then waited with bated breath for it to show up at the post office? In the last year? Think of yourself 10 years ago, like whatever age you are, just take 10 years off it. Could you have imagined any of these things would have gone away a decade from that 10 year, 10 year old ago you? Possibly not. We're now used to coming home, putting our feet up and watching catch up TV, free of the schedule of the broadcasters, downloading albums and movies virtually anytime we like with online services and apps studying online, essentially having experiences and amusements that previously weren't available to us, at least not in our homes. That is my home. Add to this that Amazon is testing drones to deliver parcels directly to your door. Pizza Hut is also testing drones to deliver pizzas directly to your door. Massive virtual worlds are now commonplace for computer game enthusiasts. And almost every major tech company, as mentioned before, is now racing to create their own virtual reality headsets. With mass adoption in mind, they're, they're, they're going big this time, uh, allowing you to explore the world and all other worlds from your home. Uh, tie this into the rapid development of personal simulators, the likes that you used to see at uh, theme parks, that are allowing simulations, very similar simulations, to be brought into your home. Essentially, we might soon live in a time where we never need to go outside and interact with the real world ever again. If we consider the virtual future of amusement, could we end up living our lives from the lounge? It doesn't take all that long for our worldviews to shift, uh, subtly but substantially. The experiences that we came to know and understand as normal have been replaced. So do open yourselves up to the idea that in the next decade, we may be having another seismic change. Uh, if we're moving towards a society where you never need to leave your home, what is that going to do to us as humans? What's that going to do to us as a society? I'm here to talk to you about virtual reality. I'm a media producer who creates educational virtual reality experiences for university students. And I'm also undertaking a PhD in what makes a good virtual reality experience. You can see from this kind of quote the sort of hyperbole that's thrown around when it comes to VR. If I had a dollar for every time I've heard the word revolution, in this sphere, I'll be on the beach right now. It's as simple as that. Um, but just as a side note, everything is revolutionary nowadays. Have you noticed that? There's revolutionary margarines. There's revolutionary workout equipment. Revolutions involve toppling governments and lopping heads, not margarine. Just a little side note there. Let me say, it's very important for me to say that I am critical uh, of the current VR cycle. I'm, I'm, I haven't drunk the Kool-Aid. I'm very critical. I don't want to say cynical, I'm critical. Um, you can, you can uh, usefully liken it to the 3D cycle, that uh, development in 3D and virtual reality, they never went away. They never really went away. They always stayed there, they're percolating along, but they definitely had you know, peaks and troughs uh, in public consciousness, without a doubt. However, there's never been a period where major companies like Sony, Microsoft, HTC, Google, Samsung are investing incredibly heavily, not just in the headsets, but also the ecosphere that, uh, that goes along with them, creating hard hardware platforms and the software that goes along to support those platforms. Here's just a tiny sample of what's currently possible in virtual reality. You may have heard recently of the paralysed patients who are visualising their limbs moving in virtual reality. Uh, and in doing so, it helps to recreate uh, neural networks and some people are actually experiencing uh, regaining movement uh, as a result of the brain seeing their limbs moving in virtual reality. I think that's fascinating. Same with some people who have had limbs removed um, and they may have uh, phantom pain or phantom itches, which you get when your, your limb is not there but your brain still thinks that it's hurting uh, or it's itchy. They don virtual reality glasses and they can see their limbs and they can give them an itch. 
or they can you know, stroke them or calm them somehow. And this tricks the brain into thinking it's all good and the pain and the itch goes away. I think it's astonishing. Virtual surgery, you can reach in, take out some organs, look around. Um, you can watch 360 degree operations live. Uh, so you can see what everyone's doing and how everyone in the room is, is interacting. Uh, you can visit and explore virtual real estate and architecture well before these buildings are built, as well as buildings that were built many, many, many years ago. You can create art where you literally paint the air to create structures in front of you. I think we talked about it a while ago. It's astonishing that uh, you literally you have, you, have this thing in your, you have this thing in your hand and you're just creating these structures out of nowhere and they stay there. It's amazing. And you can walk around them and interact with them. Virtual bungee jumping and skydiving, that appeals to me. Yes, I'm crazy about roller coasters, but I don't want to do that crazy stuff. No thanks. Uh, climbing mountains. Everest was recently filmed. Uh, the ascent of Everest was recently filmed with a 360 degree uh, video camera. Uh, or you can also climb it in very photorealistic games. Uh, you can explore everywhere in Google Street View. You know how you, you always go and look at your house in Street View? I don't know if you do that and you see how it's changed over the years. Um, you can do that in, um, in VR now. Um, you can drive high-end race cars. You can, phew, explore Netflix content in VR. Thank God for that. Um, something close to my heart is, is a virtual reality education. You can take students basically where they've never been before. Imagine going to Verona virtually while you're studying Romeo and Juliet. I think it's quite beautiful. These are now, right now, the things that you no longer need to leave your lounge for. This still is from Wall-E, which imagines humans as fat, lazy consumers of screens. So fat that they can't even walk and they're ferried about, they just, they just become consumers of screens. Well, you know what? We don't need to wait for the future to be lazy. We're lazy right now. Lazy, lazy consumers living in a lazy consumerist society. <laughs> if you don't think that we're living in a lazy consumerist society, then consider the outcomes from the research that I recently undertook with my master's degree, where I spent three years traveling the world to find out, and, and creating a documentary, to find out why roller coasters exist. Yes, there's a link between VR and roller coasters. We'll get to that in a second. We binge watch Netflix, and we consider it boastworthy on social media. We pay to simulate manual labour by going to the gym. That's what we're doing. Think about that. Really think about that. The world has changed enormously since the Industrial Revolution, and we haven't. We're still the same twitchy cavemen we always were, and we're clearly inbuilt with a hardwired need, need to stay primed. We have a strong psycholo psychological need for extreme sensations, and we simply no longer get them in modern Western societies. Roller coasters and theme parks package these extremely safe experiences as daring, boastworthy challenges. We're no longer chased by wild animals, and we don't wonder if we're going to make it through the day like we used to. It's too hard and expensive to climb Everest where we genuinely might die, and the parks know that physiologically the rush, or the peak experience is what it's called, uh, that we get from a truly epic achievement like climbing a mountain, uh, and getting on a very safe but presented as very risky experience like a giant roller coaster or thrill ride are basically identical. So they commodify the experience. Roller coasters make us think that we're doing something intense, and in doing so, it satiates our primal needs and charges us for doing so. In doing this, we've already been paying to simulate in the real world a world that no longer exists. It's useful to point out that when it comes to VR, the brain is tricked into believing the experience is real in a very similar way. The funny part is that roller coasters and VR are coming together directly. I just got back from the USA where many major theme parks are putting virtual reality headsets directly onto people on roller coasters. This creates a crazy hybrid uh, experience where one of the problems with virtual reality now, which is motion sickness, is removed. When you put uh, headsets on in a really authentic uh, virtual reality experience, what you see is not commensurate with what's happening to your body. So it, it translates as motion sickness. When you're on a roller coaster, you may be, uh, in this particular one, you were in a fighter jet and you were diving and turning and, and looping and that was commensurate with the physical sensations as to what was happening on the track at the time. So what you saw, even though technically it wasn't what was actually happening to you in real life, the experience, uh, it felt cohesive to your brain and you didn't get sick. It was quite an extraordinary experience. What I was surprised though was the reaction of the coaster enthusiasts when they got off this. They said it wasn't real. 
and I don't know what real they're talking about. What about it wasn't real? What, when you think about theme parks, what about theme parks is real? You've paid to enter a walled garden where you experience unusual and extreme sensations. You engage in these hyper-real, compacted versions of everyday experiences from the real world that you're never going to do anyway. You can travel between multiple thrilling worlds in the same day. How important is it to connect and interact with others during this experience, I ask? What does it really mean to have a human experience of something? Just how much effort do we put into pursuing distractions and amusements in our lives and why? It reminds me of a story right in the beginning uh, of this particular project. I received a grant to, uh, to go around the world and, and film the documentary and meet with academics and uh, uh, an ex-friend of mine at the time said, well, that's everything that's wrong about universities nowadays. That's just rubbish. Didn't think it was valid. And yet, he was the same kind of person that would always be, oh, ugh, it's Monday, or fantastic, it's Friday. He would be, oh, I play the radio at work because it helps make the workday go faster. Always counting the other days to his holidays on social media. So what he was actually saying is leisure was critical to his life. It was the most important thing in his life. And yet, when somebody decided to analyse a little highly popular, highly profitable piece of that leisure-making machine. That was somehow invalid. I thought that was kind of weird. So the, the takeaway from that is that we may not think it, but we're all obsessed with leisure and we're obsessed with our leisure time. So it's worth analysing something which is important. So simulators, I think, are another example of this. So I compare this uh, roller coaster VR experience as a simulator extension as opposed to a uh, new kind of roller coaster. But simulators in theme parks have gone from the reasonably simple, where you basically were sitting in a chair, there was a projection in front of you and you got kind of jostled around to the extravaganzas that you see nowadays. There, you moved invisibly between different rooms. You're, on, you're actually on moving cars. You have 4K resolution, spectacular surround sound, 3D, full immersion. It's incredible. Um, what's fascinating, again, is the human brain is easily tricked. The range of, of motion that's required to make you think that you're decelerating or you're accelerating, you're dropping, uh, is small. It's vanishingly small. It's incredibly small. The, uh, what they actually need to do to these vehicles to make you think that all these things are happening, coupled with the visual stimuli. Add to this a little blast of wind to the face or some, um, some drops of water, and you're pretty much there, which is why there's a race on to install personal simulators in the home coupled with virtual reality to create the kinds of experiences that you used to go to theme parks for. So now you don't need to leave your lounge to go to Disneyland. Might be useful at this point to mention what one of the most popular search terms related to virtual reality is nowadays. <laughs> Since almost the beginning of the latest round of VR development, VR porn has been one of the most searched for terms used in conjunction with virtual reality. What does that mean? say about us as a society. Recently, an adults-only virtual, virtual reality porn conference in Tokyo had to be shut down due to overcrowding. <laughs> I mean, it's Japan, but still. <laughs> in the same way that uh, porn pushed the boundaries of video formats to DVD, high-definition video, it's right here in the virtual world as well. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about VR porn, but I will say that it allows you to put yourself right in the middle of the action and watch what appears to be your body doing a far better job of it than you ever will. You can also integrate the experience with, the, with internet connected physical toys that you place on your person or in and the action on screen is synchronised with the physical sensations produced by these toys. It's very interesting to note that one of the biggest Australian VR porn producers said it gets you closer to the real experience. <laughs> Think about that for a second. <laughs> Other experimental forms of VR porn allow you to design, basically, click, 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 a uh, very lifelike avatar that matches whatever you're into uh, at that point in time. And you can interact with it in the way that I just described. Again, it doesn't take much to trick the mind into immersion in virtual reality in general. So for all intents and purposes, your brain believes what you're doing in that sphere is real. So now you're obese from ordering all these drone pizzas and never going outside. But now you don't even need to leave the lounge for sex. You can just download a date. So imagine yourself on the lounge in the not too distant future, exploring places you'll never visit in real life and then topping a day off with a visit from a saucy virtual friend. If this was to become mainstream, 
it could change the very nature of what it means to be human. Would you agree? Now your initial reaction might be one of distaste. This kind of experience, sitting on a lounge, that's not a life. If you're lucky enough to be able-bodied and to interact with the world in a more or less normal, for want of a better word, way, you might look at this as an introversion, uh, a retreat or a shrinking of the world that you know now. But imagine you were disabled, agoraphobic, sick, or with crippling depression. Your experience with this technology would be quite the opposite. Your world would actually be opened up. Our need for human connection is critical. We're herd animals. To be alone means danger. If you're separated from the herd, you're likely to die. We need to be around people. Uh, I was listening to a heartbreaking Radio National podcast a little while ago about young people who are disabled and they're forced to live in nursing homes. The charming, erudite, wonderful young man that was being interviewed was almost was almost desperately grateful for the reporter to be there, for someone to actually interact with, to, to tell his story to. Also, uh, I was speaking to a colleague, a social worker at one of the universities that I'm at, who said that some of the spinal patients that she works with, when they're washed in the shower, they cry, because it's the only time that they're actually touched in a caring way. These stories honestly bring a tear to my eyes. Because while we're rushing madly towards this technology that threatens to separate us, we have a desperate need for shared experiences and human contact. This leads me to ponder what does it mean to have a shared experience and why is that important? Or if virtual reality is so excitingly now and the future, what's wrong with real reality? Is it ever going to replace human interaction? You might sit there and scoff that that will never happen. But think about the last time you were on a train or a bus. What was everybody doing? Social media, I believe, is a form of virtual reality. It's certainly a constructed reality because I can assure you that the fabulous and highly impressive, highly curated life that we present online in social media does not mirror our real lives. We only invite people to be our friends who share our worldview. So we're creating little echo chambers. We're kings of our own virtual domains. Was the holiday that you went on actually as nice as that picture you put up the whole time? That wonderful dish that you made and put up, was that the first time you really made it that day? <laughs> Social media is ultimately a manufactured form of a shared experience. There's a wonderful little test I saw a while back where you ask yourself, who on your friends list online could you approach and ask to borrow 20 bucks? However you can't, you may wish to reconsider your digital friendship. The hard fact is we play these games and we have these experiences because they're often better than our everyday experience. Can we take a look at some of the next images? These images are gorgeous because they're heightened and unattainable versions of the real world. On the train, do you want to look at the other grumpy schlubs? <laughs> or do you want to look at some magical fantasy world? Well, you're the king. Sometimes the virtual simply offers a better experience. When we travel to overseas locations with virtual reality, there's no tourists. It doesn't cost thousands to get there. You only see the best bits, and you don't have that often crushing disappointment that you get with real travel. Also, you don't have to worry about that spare tyre that you develop from drinking too many frozen margaritas. Or we can pretend, like I said, that we're someone else entirely. If we can have all these positive virtual experiences without connecting to other people, is this a future we should just get used to? I want to close by talking about the film The Matrix. I'm sure everyone knows, but I'll say it anyway. In The Matrix, everything is magical and surreal. You can do whatever you want. It's utopia. But some people have worked out that it's fake. Uh, the real world is a dystopian nightmare that humans are actually being used as batteries and disposed of uh, when they're depleted. However, you have an option. You can take a blue pill and you can retreat back into The Matrix with no knowledge of the dodgy real world. Or you can take a red pill and face reality as it is with no enhancements. To be honest, I never understood in the film, I never understood in the film why they didn't just take the blue pill. Why didn't they take the blue pill? Was there actually any benefits from staying in the real world in the matrix? I don't know, I don't think that there was. Shortly as a society, we're gonna to have to choose between the blue and the red pill. The question we have to ask is which one are you gonna take? Thank you. <laughs>